Father in heaven, as we talk about why Jesus waits, but particularly the three great mysteries in the book of Revelation, we pray that you draw close to us, warm our hearts, gathering in the, gather in the wanderings of our mind, focus us on this blessing tonight, whatever blessings we receive through the week, whatever blessings we received last night or this morning or this afternoon, we come to you needing a greater blessing still. We come to you needing a sense of your presence still. And so where our hearts are weary, give us new encouragement. Where our hearts are discouraged, give us new hope. Where we're struggling with sin, may the Spirit cut the chains that bind us. And tonight, speak to our hearts, we pray thee in Christ's name. Amen. I was just flipping through the Los Angeles Times, and the headline caught my attention. In fact, it gripped me. It compelled me to read the article. Here are the headlines as I read them on one of the pages in the Los Angeles Times a few months ago. Photographer puts up models' jeans for sale. Now, the article attracted my attention. It was about a Santa Monica, California photographer who photographs what he believes are the most beautiful women in the world. They are physically attractive. They're models from Hollywood. And he had just started and launched a web page in which he was selling eggs from these models. The lowest bid was $15,000, but these models' eggs could be sold for as high as $150,000. Now, it was the subtitle on the article that really captured my attention. And here was the subtitle. This is Darwin's natural selection at its best. Now, this is what he meant. He said, the reason I am charging $150,000 for some of these models' eggs is because they are so highly developed on the evolutionary chain. These are the most beautiful women in the world, so you would expect to pay higher for their eggs than you would any other woman. Now, really, now, in other words... This isn't some lowly peasant's eggs. This isn't some poverty-stricken woman's eggs. This isn't some inner-city pregnant teenager child's eggs. These eggs are of highest value because these women are so highly evolved, they are more beautiful than anybody else. So you need to pay up. Now, I want to ask you a question. How do you say that the eggs of these women are more beautiful than anybody else? More value than anybody else? Who is putting a price tag on the eggs of any human being? Are you to say that because a child is born physically deformed, they have less value than models that sell Cadillacs by sitting on the hood with a skirt halfway up their legs? Are you to say that a child born of an inner city pregnant mother who may not look as physically attractive is of less value than a Hollywood model? Who puts the value signs on? What if you're physically attractive, but you're proud, you're arrogant, you're selfish? But what if you have cerebral palsy and your head is cocked to one side and your hands are crippled up and food's running down your chin and spotting your blouse? But in your heart, you're kind and gentle and thoughtful and compassionate. What if you are physically unattractive, but there is a charm, a graciousness, a kindness about you? Who puts value on human beings? It seems to me that the value system of the world is warped. But the value system of Christ, Christ sees every human being as valuable. Christ sees every human being as precious. Three great mysteries in the book of Revelation. 
not the mysteries of the beast, not the mysteries of a mark, not the mystery of 666, three great mysteries in the book of Revelation, mysteries that we may never fully understand, but mysteries we can experience, and mysteries that I believe unlock the reason why Jesus waits. Not mysteries of a prophetic time chart and a reinterpretation of time prophecies focused on speculation, but mysteries that go to the heart of Christianity, mysteries that go to the essence of life, mysteries that go to the reason for our existence, but mysteries that although the human mind can never fully understand, it can appreciate It can experience. Now, if there is something that is infinite, and the mysteries that I'm going to share with you tonight are infinite, but when something is infinite, it doesn't mean that you can't know anything about it. When something is infinite, the more you know about it, the more there is to know. So the infinite mysteries of God are not mysteries that should not be studied. They are mysteries that the more you study the more there is to study. The more you know, the more there is to know. You can never fully plumb the depths. You can never fully comprehend. You can never fully understand because there is more there. The first great mystery in the book of Revelation that human beings in this life will never fully understand, but the more we live, the more we can appreciate, and through the ceaseless ages of eternity, we'll be studying it more as this. How can a God of infinite wisdom and infinite intelligence and a God that is worshipped by cherubim and seraphim, a God that has millions and trillions of heavenly beings that sing his praises, a God that has five billion people clawing at one another for living space on planet Earth. How can that God love me? How can that God know my name? How can that God care for me? That is one of the great mysteries of the book of Revelation. God's personal care. God's intimate care. God's concern for you and for me. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 helps us to catch a glimpse of that intimacy. It helps us to catch a glimpse of that God that knows my name, that God that understands my heartaches and longings, that God that invites me into a personal relationship with him. There is nothing like this in Hinduism. There is nothing like this in Buddhism. There is nothing like this in Confucianism. The God of Revelation, the God of the cosmos, the God of the infinite, longs to be the God who is personal, longs to be the God that enters into a relationship with us, longs to be the God that, un- that we understand his care and his concern and his love. One of the great mysteries of the book of Revelation is the mystery of God's personal care, the mystery of God's personal concern, the mystery of God's personal interest. We find it there in Revelation 2 in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has a what? An ear. Let him do what? Hear. The word hear in the New Testament does not merely mean listen. The Greek word for hear is the word akuo. It means let him not only hear with his ears, but let him hear with his heart. Let him hear with his mind. Let him hear in the inner recesses of his soul. Let him understand is another translation. Let him comprehend. He that has an ear, let him understand. Let him comprehend what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except he who receives it. Well, if nobody knows it, it's a mystery. But there is somebody who knows it. Who knows it? The one who receives it. The one who receives what? The mystery of the white stone. The one who receives the white stone. Now, what is that white stone? 
The white stone is a symbol of intimacy. It's a symbol between God and that person. There is probably no other place in the book of Revelation that describes that oneness, that intimacy between God and our souls as the mystery of the white stone. The white stone carries with it rich symbolism. What, does the, what is the meaning of this white stone? There are really four aspects of it. Now, if you look a little earlier in the text, it says, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I'll give him the white stone. The white stone, whatever it means, is connected with the manna. Now, the rabbis had a legend. And you remember the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And as they did, every day God rained manna out of heaven except Sabbath. Manna rained from heaven six days of the week. The seventh day, no manna rained. If they kept the manna over for more than one day, the manna spoiled. But on Friday, twice as much fell. They gathered it. It kept over Sabbath. Now the rabbis had a legend and they said this. Not only did manna fall from heaven, but as the Israelites gathered the manna, there were white stones that they gathered. Those white stones, according to the rabbis, represented all of the blessings of God in life, all of the provisions of God. They represented how God, good God was. So every time you doubt how God, good God is, the rabbis said, take out your white stone and remember, it's God that causes your heart to beat. It's God that causes your lungs to inhale and exhale. It's God that gives you every breath. It is God that in Him we live and move and have our being. It is God that causes the sun to shine. It is God that causes the gentle rain to fall. It's God that causes manna to fall from heaven. He provides every meal on your table, everything you have that is good, everything you have that is bountiful, everything you have that causes life to be sustained, all the physical blessings, all the emotional blessings, every twinkle in the eye of your wife as she takes your hand, every smile on your husband's face, every bit of laughter in the face of your kids, all that comes from God and that's what the white stone represents. And when God says in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17, I'm going to give you a white stone, he is saying to you, I am going to give you all the bounties of life, all the joys of life, every blessing you have. Seize it, grasp it, hold on to it. It is part of the mystery of how much I love you and how much I care for you. That's the first aspect of the white stone. But there is more. There is more. No place in the book of Revelation is God's love revealed more than in the white stone symbolism. Second symbol of the white stone is this. In ancient times, when a person was tried, the judge didn't stand against them, he stood for them. Now, if you get a traffic ticket because you're driving home from camp meeting and you want to get home quickly, and you're going 79 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone and you have to appear before the judge, you're not looking forward to that. In ancient times, the judge presented all the evidence for you. And if the jury was going to make its decision, the judge stood with two stones, a black stone and a white stone. If the jury said condemned, the judge with tears in his eyes and a lament would have to say guilty and drop the black stone. If the jury said acquitted, forgiven, the judge would say not guilty and drop the white stone. Jesus says to you, here is the white stone. No black stone for you. Whatever sin you have committed, whatever guilt plagues your life, no black stone for you. I'm placing in your hand the white stone. That white stone represents my love, my concern. That white stone represents the righteousness of Christ and the white purity of His garments. That stone represents that you are forgiven, you are acquitted. If you've come to camp meeting today, tonight, 
with guilt in your life, in this meeting, bow your head and say, God, forgive me. And by faith, reach out and take the white stone. He wants to put it in your hand. He wants you to leave this meeting free from guilt and acquitted and knowing that you're forgiven by God. The white stone, Christ provides all the physical blessings of life. The white stone, Christ forgives you. There's another aspect of the white stone. Surrounding the Israelites, there were pagans. These pagans wore what is known as amulets. Amulets are stones worn around the neck that have the name of the pagan gods. That was true in the days of Rome. The pagans wore amulets, stones around their neck, usually a single stone. On that single stone was the name of their god. So if you're a worshiper of Apollo or Aphrodite or Zeus, you wore that amulet around your neck with the name of your god. The name of the god represented that you belong to that god. You belong to Zeus. You belong to Aphrodite. So Jesus says, I will give you a white stone with my name on it and your new name. Jesus says, you are a blood-bought soul. You belong to me. Your eyes are my eyes. Your ears are my ears. Your hands are my hands. You are mine. See, the white stone symbolism is so rich. It describes a great mystery that the God of heaven is interested in me. The God of heaven gives me all the good things of life, physically, mentally, spiritually. The God of heaven gives me, acquittal, he forgives my sins. The God of heaven in Christ has claimed me. I am sanctified, set apart, holy only for God. The white stone represents that I am his. There's one last aspect of the white stone that's incredible. Probably the most significant aspect. And it's this. As travelers traveled in the ancient world, there were not hotels. You didn't travel along and see a sign that would say, Ramada Inn, Marriott Inn, Howard Johnson's, 21 miles, next exit. You didn't see that. As you traveled through the ancient world, you were dependent on the hospitality of people that lived along these dirt highways that connected the Roman world. Later, they had peeved highways in the Roman world. And as chariots went along and others, you were always dependent on the hospitality of a friend. You were dependent on them for water, dependent on them for food, dependent on them for lodging. If you were traveling in the ancient world and you came across the home of, a, the, the home of somebody that was unusually hospitable, that person would invite you in. You may stay there two days, three days. After staying there for two or three or four days, that person very often would take a white stone, take a little mallet, put it on a rock and hit it and break it in half. And that person would say to you, I am going to give you half of this white stone and I'm going to keep the other half. If your son, your daughter, your brother comes this way two years from now, three years now, five years from now, We've been together for three days. We're bonded. We're friends. You've stayed here five days, six days. We are now like brothers. I'm going to give you this half of the white stone. If your son, your daughter ever comes along this way, tell them to bring their half of the white stone. This, their half of the white stone indicates that they can sit at my table. That they can put their feet under my table. It is their key to my home. It is that sense that my door is always open. If I die, my son will have the white stone. He'll live in his home. If he dies, his son will have that white stone. Pass that white stone down through your family. It is a symbol that your family and my family are one, that we can eat at the same table. Jesus says, here's your half of the white stone. We're one. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And one day there is going to be a long table in a place called glory, in a place called eternity. You can put your feet, Jesus says, under my table. Why is it that the God of heaven and the God of the universe cares for me so? Why is it that he knows my name? He knows the house that I live in. How is it that this God 
of all the universe wants to forgive my sins, wants to claim me as my own, as his own, wants me to put my feet under his table. You say, preacher, that's good for preachers to preach about. It's nice to sing about this love of God, this special place that God has in his heart only for me. There's a place in God's heart only for you. And if you don't feel that vacancy in God's heart, God will be lonely forever. Well, you say, preacher, that's good to preach about. Good to talk about. But really now, God has 10,000 times 10,000 cherubims. He has 10,000 times 10,000 seraphims. He has a million other people. 10 million other, 100 million other, 5 billion other. If I am lost, God won't even know it. Come on, preacher. It's nice to talk about, but it just isn't true in my life and experience. How could God care for me that much? I wonder how many of you have more than one child. Can I see your hands? More than one. Now, that's a good percentage of this audience. Let's suppose that it's an absolutely wonderful Carolina Thanksgiving. Do you folk down here in, in, in Carolina celebrate Thanksgiving? Let's suppose it's a fantastic Carolina Thanksgiving. I mean, Mama, you have been cooking. I mean, you've been cooking for four days. I mean, you've made whole wheat muffins and whole wheat bread and Carolina pecan pies and apple pies. Oh, it is a fantastic time. All the kids are going to be home. I mean, your three children are going to be home. Tom is going to be there and Joe is going to be there and your daughter Alice is going to be there and their spouses are going to be there. The three kids, their spouses, all of your grandkids, all 11 of them are going to be there. I mean, you've been cooking and cooking and cooking and it comes Thanksgiving morning and there's a little chill in the Carolina air and you put a little fire in the fireplace. It's a picturesque morning and all the food is on the table. I mean, there is cabbage salad and tossed salad and Greek salad and ambrosia salad and all the salads. I mean, you have gone all out and there's a special table just for the pies. Oh, it's a fantastic. There's mashed potatoes and peas and carrots and corn. And there are relish plates. And there is veggie turkey. I mean, it is terrific. And there is homemade soy ice cream for dessert. This is a healthful meal. It's tremendous. And all the kids, the three kids, the three grandkids. The three kids, their spouses, the 11 grandkids. It's Thanksgiving. You go and to sit at the table, and there's this long table, about ready to have grace. And you say, it's, your husband says, it's wonderful to have the whole family here. You're standing at the table next to your husband. He says, it's wonderful to have the whole family here. But you remember, you have an 18-year-old son. He's not there. You brought him up in Sabbath school. And you remember the first time you smelt tobacco on his breath. You remember the time that in the academy he got in trouble and the principal called home and said he was drinking. And you remember when Bobby said to you, Mama, I don't want anything to do with your legalistic old religion. I'm out of here. He left. Mother's Day came. No phone call. First time you didn't hear from him. Your birthday came. No card. No letter. No phone call. You waited all day. But it never came. You heard from a friend that he was living in a flop house in New York City. No running water, no electricity, with a few other druggies. He was eating hamburgers from McDonald's out of a garbage can in the back of McDonald's that people threw away and he'd have his head in the garbage can pick up a quarter of a hamburger that somebody didn't want and he'd eat it. And that Thanksgiving, 
You've got three of your kids there, but one isn't. You've got their spouses there. You've got 11 grandkids there. And the house is filled with joy. And as you stand holding hands around the table, you look at Bobby's spot, and he's not there. And you leave that circle and go into your bedroom, Mama, and you're bawling your eyes out. You are just crying and crying. And your husband walks in and he puts his arm around you and his arms around you and he says, Honey, what's the matter? It's Thanksgiving. We've got so much to be thankful for. Everybody's here. And you look at your husband through your tear-stained eyes and you say, Everybody is not here. Bobby's missing. And there's a place in my heart only for him. Because you can have 11 grandkids there. And you can have three kids there and their spouses. But if there is one that is missing, all of the presence of the others do not make up for that one. There is an emptiness in your heart for the one that's gone. You do not want everybody. And you don't want anybody. You want somebody. You want Bobby's smile. You want Bobby's kiss on your cheek. You want Bobby's embrace. And one day, the one that put love in the hearts of mothers, and the one that put love in the hearts of fathers, one day he will sit at a great Thanksgiving service in eternity. In a feast called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And he will look down a long, long, long table with the redeemed of all the ages. And if you are not there, it is a divine mystery that I can never understand. I can only experience and appreciate. If you are not there, there will be an emptiness in God's heart forever. There'll be a loneliness in God's heart forever. Why does Jesus wait? Why hasn't Jesus come? Because as of yet, his people don't realize how much he loves, how much he cares, how much he wants them, how lonely he is for them. However much you want Jesus to come, his loneliness for you is greater. And he can never come back again until there is a group of people who sense that they're special to him, who sense that there is a place in his heart only for them. First great mystery in the book of Revelation is the mystery of his incredible love. The second great mystery in the book of Revelation is found in Revelation chapter 7. It is the mystery of how that love will allow his people to go through the greatest trials in the history of the universe when all hell breaks loose on a planet called Earth. And those trials will not destroy them. Those trials will only deepen their faith. Now that is a mystery. Because in most instances, trials destroy faith for those that are not Christians. In most instances, trials crush people if they're not Christians. But one of the great mysteries of the book of Revelation is that when the crisis breaks, the Jesus that was with his people through the ages will be with them then. I love the song, Just When I Need It, Jesus is Near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, just when I need him most. One of the great mysteries of the book of Revelation is the final trial, the union of church and state, the mysterious mark 666, the time that no man could buy or sell. One of the great mysteries, the seventh last plague. They do not destroy God's people. They only reveal God's holding power greater. They only reveal God's love in a more magnificent way. And through all those trials, through all those difficulties, through all those hardships, that God's people go through. 
We trust Him more. Our faith deepens. Our love for Him becomes greater. And we hang on and long for heaven more. Trials do not make us bitter. They make us better. Trials do not destroy our faith. They enable our faith to grow. Revelation chapter 7 says this. Revelation 7 and verse 13. Then one of the elders answering to me said, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? The elder is surprised. The question is one of surprise. The question is one of amazement. How in the world could these people have white robes? That is to say, how could they shine with the glory of Jesus? How could they shine with the brightness of Christ? How could they shine with the character of our Lord? Where did they ever come from? And the answer isn't. The answer is not that they came from peace and prosperity and they just believed it and claimed it and they just floated into heaven and everything was wonderful. Not the answer. The answer is verse 14. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are ones that came out of great tribulation. The tribulation did not destroy their faith. The tribulation only intensified their faith. The tribulation did not destroy their courage. It only enabled their courage to be greater in God. They persevered. They hung on. A number of years ago, I read the fascinating story. Some of you may have read it. Of the royal mosque in Tehran. Our Muslim friends were making one of the most beautiful mosques in the world. And they decided to have cut glass mirrors made in Italy. And these cut glass mirrors were to be put in the foyer of the mosque. A translucent glass roof was made so that the sun would shine through. And the engineer who designed it designed it so that as you walk into the entryway of this Muslim mosque in Tehran, as the sun shone through, it would reflect the blue sky and clouds off the mirrors in the foyer. It would appear that you were walking on the clouds. It would appear you were in the midst of the cloudy blue heavens, and that was the idea. As you entered into the mosque, you're entering into heaven itself. These cut glass mirrors were made in Italy at the cost of well over $100,000. They were flown to Tehran. On the way to the building site, the truck that was carrying them had a tragic accident and they were cracked. Word came to the building site that these precious mirrors were cracked. The chief engineer said, bring them. They were brought. He took a hammer and he began to hit them. Crack, crack. Crack, crack. He broke them even more. Then he took one piece of glass, a second piece of glass, a third piece of glass. He took these cracked mirrors. He made a mortar and he began putting one cracked piece and another cracked piece and another cracked piece. If you walked into that foyer today, as the sun shines through the clear ceiling, and as it's reflected off individual cracked pieces of mirror, it appears as you are walking in a field of diamonds. It's absolutely brilliant. Yellows and oranges reflecting off those cracked pieces of glass. And there's a sign as you enter that foyer, and the sign says this. Broken to be made beautiful. Broken to be made beautiful. Are you going through some trial in your life right now? Are you going through some difficulty in your life right now in your health, in your finances, in your marriage with your kids? Do you feel that you're at the end of your rope and you are crushed and broken? The God that loves you with an intimate love, the God that cares for you in ways you can never imagine, the God that will be lonely forever if you're not in heaven, that God 
is going to enable you to triumph in trial. That God is allowing this brokenness only so you can be made beautiful. In the trials today, in the trials tomorrow, in the trials in the future, Revelation's great mystery is this, that Satan cannot destroy us in trial. Satan cannot crush us in trial. Satan cannot stamp out our feet in trial, our faith in trial. He that is with us is greater than he that is with him. Can you say amen? God in trial is going to build your faith. You will come forth to shine as the stars in God's kingdom. Last great mystery in the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 21. Here it is. Probably the greatest mystery of all. And it is this. Now just think about it. If sin originated in a perfect world in heaven, if sin originated thousands of years ago, what is to say that a million trillion years from now, sin will not rise up again? Why is it that the sin that arose in a perfect world thousands of years ago why is it the sin problem, with all of its heartache, its war, its famine, its murder, its robbery, its greed, its heartache, its sorrow, its sickness, its cancer, its heart disease, why is it that sin will never rise up again? Why not? Revelation 21 discusses that mystery, and it says, Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said to me, three words, it is done. It is done. It's finished. It's over. It's complete. War and worry, over. Heartache and horror, over. Famines and frustration, over. Cancer and crime, over. God says, it is done. It's finished. It's settled. It is settled in the universe because it is settled in our mind. Christ is all we want. We want no more, no less, and we want it for all eternity. And echoing and re-echoing through the whole universe, we cry out with God. It is settled in my mind. It is done in my mind. It is over in my mind. It is finished in my mind. It is settled. It's done. It's finished. Now, we live in an age where men and women are urged and encouraged to have open minds. And the idea is, don't be closed-minded. Don't be narrow. Don't be closed-minded. Be open-minded. Weigh out everything. Look at everything. Read everything. Watch everything. Be open-minded. As if that open-mindedness is a sign of some kind of intellectual maturity. Oh, I'm here to tell you tonight that there are some things that you get settled. There are some things that I am very closed-minded in. Closed-minded is not a negative thing. In many things, it's a positive thing. When it comes to the existence of God, I am closed-minded. I don't have to wake up every morning and say, what's the evidence for God's existence? I settle that in my mind. When it comes to the inspiration of the Bible, I don't have to wake up every day with doubt and fear and wonder, is this book inspired or not? I looked at the evidence on the issue of the Bible, I don't mind to tell you, I am closed-minded. When it comes to Jesus as my Savior and forgiving my sins, I settled that long ago. I'm closed-minded. When it comes to the Sabbath, I don't have to look every Friday night at sundown. I've got to study the evidence again. I've got to rehearse it again. Will I go to church or won't I go to church tomorrow? Is it Sabbath or Sunday? On that issue, I've settled it. It's good to be closed-minded. Now look, 33 years ago I got married. I'm not open anymore. I'm not available anymore. You can march a hundred women before me, and on that subject, I've settled it. On that 
subject, I'm closed-minded. Any man here can say amen? If he doesn't, give him an elbow, lady, please. You see, I don't have to worry. Now, do I have to weigh out, should I be married or shouldn't I be married? On that subject, I'm closed-minded. God is going to have a group of people that are so in love with Him, that are so committed to Him, that when they think of the God of the universe caring for them, when they think of the infinite God of the universe having a place in His heart only for them, when they think of this God of the universe who's forgiven them, this God of the universe who's taken away their guilt, this God of the universe that causes the sun to rise just for them, that causes the flowers to bloom just for them, that causes the food to grow with all of its varieties just for them. When they think of this God who brought them into existence, you know, you don't have, you don't have to be a functioning human being. You didn't choose to live. You could be a mosquito tonight. You could be a lizard on a tree. You could be a horse running in a field or a cow. But in the divine drama of destiny, I can't understand it. God conceived me in his mind before I was conceived in my mother's womb. And God shaped me and God fashioned me and God brought me into existence as a reasoning, functioning, rational, worshiping human being. And God is longing for a group of people that so appreciate him that so loves him, that so serves him, that all they want is Jesus. And they want Jesus today, and they want him tomorrow, and they want him forever. And they long to be with him through all eternity, and their heart's longing, their insatiable desire, their unquenchable thirst, their hungry appetite longs for heaven, longs for eternity, longs for Christ, longs for the presence of God. He waits for that people. He waits for that people. I pray that you and I would have that heart hunger, that you and I would have that longing, that we've settled it in our mind so he can settle it in the universe as we pray tonight. Would you like to say, oh God, give me that desire to be with you. Give me that hunger to live with you. Give me that insatiable desire to want God. Lord, you want me, and tonight I want you. Would you just raise your hand? You want God to deepen this love, to deepen this desire. You want him to break the bonds that tie us to earth. Our eyes are so earthly focused. Our hearts are so earthly focused. But you want to be heavenly minded and heavenly focused. Oh, Father, we love you. And there's a place in your heart only for us. You care for us. Oh, Father, three mysteries in Revelation. The mystery of your incredible love. The mystery of your building faith in trial. The mystery of your settling the great controversy in the universe because it's settled in our hearts. Oh, Father, tonight we just want to tell you that all we long for is Jesus. And we want more and more and more and more of him. Today, tomorrow, and throughout all the universe, and throughout eternity. In Christ's name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls down 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. 
is coming soon.